Hello there and welcome back to the channel. In this video I'd like to talk about corpus linguistic approaches to metaphor. How can we use corpus data and a concordance tool such as ANTCONC to study metaphor? There are three issues that I want to talk about. First of all, I'll have a few things to say about conceptual metaphor theory. That is going to be the framework, the theoretical framework that we'll be using for the corpus linguistic analyses. And then I'll talk about two different approaches um, for the corpus linguistic study of metaphor. And the approaches are very similar, except that the first starts with the so-called source domain of the conceptual metaphor, and the second one starts with the so-called target domain. If you've never heard these terms before, source domain, target domain, don't worry, I'll explain what those mean. Um, on the other hand, if you've been following this channel, you probably know that I have a bunch of videos on conceptual metaphor and related issues, so I'll put links in the description below if you want to explore this topic a little bit further. All right, but <clears throat> if you're completely new to conceptual metaphor, that's fine. You won't need anything of that to follow the content in this video. All right, let's go. Uh, conceptual metaphor theory, what is it? Um, it is a theory of metaphor that has been developed by uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson in a book that is um, quite famous. Yeah, so here it is, Metaphors We Live By. And in that book, Lakoff and Johnson make a very radical and important claim. Namely, they argue that metaphor is not so much a uh, phenomenon that is linguistic. It's not so much a phenomenon that is concerned with words. Rather, they argue, that metaphor is a way of thinking. Metaphor is a cognitive phenomenon. Metaphor has to do with seeing the world. Um, and their definition of metaphor reads like this. So they say the essence of metaphor is understanding one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing. So that's a lot different from other definitions of metaphor that you may have come across. So I take it that many of you have an understanding of metaphor that says, well, this is something that you find in poetry or in artistic uses of language and language that is highly charged with unusual meaning. Yeah, And uh, Lakoff and Johnson sort of go in the exact opposite direction. They say that, no, metaphor is really not just something that you find in literature, but rather it's something that characterizes everyday language. Yeah, So not only in works of art do we have uh, yeah, uh, writers or poets who try to make you understand one kind of thing in terms of another kind of thing, but really in the most mundane of texts we find uh, examples where people think about one thing in terms of another. And because that's kind of abstract and um, <clears throat> complicated at first, let me give you a few examples here. So here we have a few sentences that are not at all poetic, that uh, are things that you could uh, either read in uh, a text or you could have a friend who utters these sentences and you would not think of them as particularly poetic or metaphorical or artistic. Yeah. So let me read them to you. Yeah. So when I say she has published widely in the field of cognitive psychology, um, there is uh, the word field in there. Yeah. <clears throat> so an ordinary field is like, well, <clears throat> you go outside and there are fields where, uh, I don't know, you have cows or there's something growing on it. Yeah, that's what a field is. So why are we using this word field here um, in this context yeah, where, when we're talking about the field of cognitive psychology? Or right, let's take the next uh, sentence. My dissertation straddles the line between linguistics and philosophy. Okay. So a line, <clears throat> something like this, yeah? There are lines on this paper. Um, why is there a line between linguistics and philosophy? I mean, linguistics, that's uh, a scientific discipline, philosophy too. Um, 
you cannot put them on a piece of paper and draw a line between them, but it seems that we're talking about them that way. Yeah. Um, okay. This article goes beyond the traditional boundaries of particle physics. I have no idea what particle physics is about. Yeah. Um, but apparently it has boundaries. Yeah. So there's a line <laughs> again uh, that you can go beyond. Or uh, let's take the fourth sentence. This finding has opened up entirely new areas of research. Okay. Um, <clears throat> open up. Yeah. What's that about? So what I hope you see is that all of these sentences have something in common, namely that we talk about scientific disciplines as though they were areas in space. Yeah. Um, so regions in space that you can explore, you can walk around them, you can cross a line. First you're in one area and then you're in another. Uh, if you're close to the edge of one area and the beginning of another, well, you're sort of in between. You can talk to people on both sides. That's how we think about scientific disciplines as areas in space. <clears throat> and this is weird. Yeah, this is weird for all numbers of reasons, um, <clears throat> but apparently a very productive understanding of something that is abstract, that is not easily understood, uh, that is not easily explained or described to someone else. Whenever something is complicated, we as human beings resort to metaphorical explanations of what it is. Yeah, right. Um, so Lakoff and Johnson came up with the idea that metaphor involves two domains, a so-called source domain, which provides the words that we're using to talk about something complicated. And this complicated thing, that is the target domain. Yeah. So in this case, the source domain is the domain of space, where we have things like a physical area of space, um, you can move across boundaries, you can discover new territory, and so on and so forth. And uh, we project all of these elements into the domain of scientific disciplines. So an area in space corresponds to a scientific discipline. Being in a borderline region corresponds to working on two disciplines. Moving across boundaries means you change disciplines. <clears throat> and uh, if you're really lucky, you maybe discover a new territory and that then will <clears throat> uh, be a scientific discovery. Okay, um, so the first one would be the source domain and uh, the second one would be the target domain. Yeah, Source is where the words come from, the source of the words. Target domain is what we're trying to understand, the target of our understanding. Let me give you another example of a mapping between a source domain and a target domain. On this slide, we have a few examples that talk about happiness. Happiness, that's a feeling that you can directly experience yeah, in your belly or however you experience happiness. But how do we talk about it? Here are a few examples. Um, so it's not easy to find true happiness. Yeah? So happiness is something that you find like your keys or your way out of the parking lot. Um, I hope this day will bring you the happiness we are all searching for. Um, so again, happiness, that's something that you're searching for. And we have uh, a day that will bring it to us. So happiness is a kind of object that someone can bring and then you have it. Yeah. So, uh, so not only can you go and search it, uh, it's, it's, a thing that you can find and someone can bring it to you. Thoreau was successful in his quest for happiness. So, okay, again, the kind of searching that goes on. <clears throat> uh, and a quest, that's a search that is difficult. You have to be heroic to, you know, see it through and everything. Um, Plato and Aristotle could not show the way to happiness. Okay. So again, there is a path that leads to happiness. And then when you're at the end of the path, you find happiness. And there is this way. And this other example with the quest suggests that the way may not be a particularly easy one. Hmm? 
Right. So all of these examples point to the conclusion that happiness is an object that can be found. It's probably a valuable object. Yeah. So you don't go on a quest for toilet paper unless you're watching this video in early 2020, in which case, yes, you are. Um, right. Um, so happiness is an object that can be found. Let's look at the mappings. So we have a domain of searching or finding yeah and we have a domain of happiness so all of uh, these sentences were really about attaining happiness and how it's hard and what you have to do and whatnot so we have a searcher someone who's on the quest for something someone who's searching something and we have an experiencer someone who experiences happiness at the end of the day or who at least is looking for for happiness Happiness itself corresponds to an object that is hidden somewhere or located somewhere where it's not easily seen or easily discovered. And uh, looking for the object, it's kind of a treasure hunt, right? So looking for the object, going on that treasure hunt, uh, maps onto trying to attain uh, happiness and then finding the object if you're really lucky and you find your soulmate or you find your vocation you know the thing that you want to do for the rest of your life you attain happiness okay so i hope you see that these correspondences are systematic yeah, it's not just you know one expression that constitutes the metaphor rather it is a systematic configuration of ideas where the elements of the source domain map onto the elements of the target domain. Okay, so um, in a nutshell then, we have source domains and target domains, and the source domains are typically concerned with direct bodily experience. These are things that we know well, that we understand very well, that we can explain and talk about very well, and target domains are more abstract ideas. So scientific disciplines are abstract. Happiness, yes, it's something that we can feel, but still, it's something that is hard to communicate. It's abstract. It's not easily shown to someone else. Okay, so that means that there are typical source domains, like space, for instance. We've seen that in uh, the scientific areas. Also, the searching for happiness, searching that is moving through space and so on and so forth. Yeah. So space is something that we experience regularly, that we know very well. And so it appears a lot in source domains of conceptual metaphor. Um, I've given you a couple examples here. Yeah. So when I say a central idea, yeah, the uh, word central relates to the domain of space. It's really about the domain of importance. Um, when I say she's a strong candidate, <clears throat> strong is about force, but really I'm talking about a competition in something that is a lot more abstract. Yeah, When I'm looking for a good candidate for the job, <clears throat> that is not going to be one uh, candidate that can lift heavy things, but rather uh, someone who's intellectually competitive. Um, okay, when we have something like turn this to your advantage, the verb turn, it's about physical manipulation of things. Yeah, But here, in this context, it's really about social relations. It's about something more abstract, not about moving things around. Um, when we talk about a clear explanation, the adjective clear has to do with vision. Yeah? If something is clear, then we can see it easily. But a clear explanation has nothing to do with vision. It has everything to do with logic and with understanding and with reasoning. <clears throat> and then the last example, a bitter disappointment. Here we have the adjective bitter, which describes taste, but really it's about disappointment, so it's about emotions, right? So in all of these cases, the words from the source domains describe something that I can experience with my body, and the target domains are about something that is a lot more abstract. Okay, that was like the 10-minute intro to uh, conceptual metaphor theory. If you want to find out more about it, if you want to find out more about empirical studies on it, um, links in the description below. All right. So 
Let's turn to the corpus linguistic analyses of metaphors that I promised in the beginning of this video. Okay, let's do some actual corpus linguistic searches. If you're my student, fire up ANCOG and load in the BNCA corpus files. Um, <clears throat> your ANCOG interface should look a little bit like this. If you're not my student and you still want to follow along, then I'd say pick any concordancer that you have lying around and uh, load in a corpus that is at least 10 million words in size. Yeah? So that kind of size should give you decent results. We are using corpus data that uh, have about 12 million words. Right, uh, there's one more preparation that we need to do. I want you to set the tag settings to hide tags. So in AntConc, settings, global settings, select the tag category and uh, select hide tags so that we just see the words in our searches. Yeah, so this button and then hit apply and then you should be good to go. Okay, what are we going to search for? We're going to search for, search for, yeah? So we'll start with the source domain and we'll be searching for immaterial things. Um, so do me a favor, in the search window, uh, in the concordance tool of AntConc, type in search and then a star, then a white space, and then the word for, okay? So um, fair warning, we're using a quite large corpus uh, and so this may actually take a while, the searches and the other operations that we're going to do. So <clears throat> uh, don't get impatient, you know, it, it will perform eventually. Um, all right. So what I want you to do with uh, this concordance, yours may look a little different depending on how your sorting uh, parameters are set. But for mine, you see that my concordance is sorted after the first, second, and third word on the right. This is what I have here. Uh, I've set the context window to 115. So if you want a little bit more context, you know, set it as high or as low as you like, and you should get results that are similar to what I have here. Now I want you to work with this concordance. I want you to identify three examples where search for actually refers to literal searches for physical objects. And then I want you to identify three examples where uh, the writer is talking about metaphorical searches, so searches that target abstract ideas things that are not objects lying around in space that we can find somewhere, okay? If uh, you are not following along with the concordance tool, you can just look at these examples here and find examples that either express literal searches or metaphorical searches. So take five minutes to do that, pause the video and come back after that. I'll continue in three, two, one, now. So. Uh, if we go through this, yeah, <clears throat> obviously there will be some examples where you can't really decide on the basis of four words to the left and four words to the right, but there are examples where you can be pretty sure that what you have is either a perfectly literal example or a perfectly metaphorical example. So um, <clears throat> I'm looking at line five here. <clears throat> Someone squeezed the purple bruises in his search for a break in the skin. Okay, a break in the skin, that's not an object, but it's something physical. It's something that you can find, you know, you have to look uh, a little bit and then you see it and then you have found it. So that would be an example of literal searching for. <coughs> um, okay. Um, now. Metaphorical examples. There's one down here. Well, there's two actually. So, uh, Carlos search for a cultural identity. So, when you're searching for a cultural identity, you don't find it in one of those old boxes you have lying around in the attic. Yeah. So, a cultural identity is something that you have to, well, 
<clears throat> imagine and then you have to live your identity and so on and so forth yeah so one thing that you can do if you have the concordance tool open actually is that you uh, click on this and uh, Anconc will take you to the file view so do me a favor and click on this um, on, on the second cultural identity example and uh, there we have the context yeah <clears throat> His preoccupations are unusual, if not unique, as he claims, but they are unquestionably engendered by the search for a cultural identity, which lies behind so much of Latin America's greatest artistic and literary creations. Okay, so someone is on a quest for their true self, yeah? <clears throat> trying to find out who they are. Um, and you actually see that there's another search for in this context. So this is not just searching for identity, this is also something searching for something else. Ambivalence towards European culture, doubts about the possibilities of finding an authentic voice. So, okay, so you search for your culture, you try to find your voice, a restless search for confidence and self-esteem. So this makes me think that the metaphor you know, searching for, for happiness, uh, searching for cultural identity, searching for confidence and a voice. That's actually something broader that uh, hangs together in some way. We'll come back to this. Now, um, you can look at those concordances and uh, examine individual examples and try to um, develop your thoughts on what metaphors you find there. But there is actually a way to not really take a shortcut, but to uh, get a more broad perspective on the kinds of words that we find in the context of search. And that would be the collocate tool that we've already been using. Yeah? So the last two videos uh, were about collocation measures. So here's actually an opportunity for us to put that dry statistical knowledge to some um, purpose yeah so what we have here is um, <clears throat> a collocate search yeah so it's the same expression search for I just left that I uh, clicked into the collocate window and uh, hit start but um, I fiddled with the parameters here so you see that I selected a window span from the search term so that would be a zero here to three words to the right. Yeah? So search for and then whatever words follow. And uh, since we're using the mutual information statistic, which can be very, very sensitive to low frequencies, I set the minimum collocate frequency to three. Okay, that's something that I would recommend when you're using mutual information in order to not get these uh, just pure chance spurious results of rare words in there. Uh, set the collocate frequency just a little bit higher so uh, that the results that you're getting actually reflect uh, events that happen a little bit more often than just once. Okay. Um, here I selected sort by statistic instead of sort by frequency. If you set all of these parameters in the same way, uh, you should be getting these same results. Yeah. Okay, so what do we actually search for? Survivors, evidently. Yeah, so the, that's a literal search. But after that, we have dignity, happiness, truth, meaning, identity. So how many? One, two, three, four. So the following five collocates are all about metaphorical searches. And you notice that, well, dignity, happiness, truth, meaning, and identity, those are ideas that are related on some level, right? So they're all positively connotated. They're all about you know things that are fundamental to human existence and are sort of philosophical and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, yeah, we also search for drugs and for food and for our keys. Um, 
Yeah. So, so you have the entire human condition in these little keywords here. So one moment you're trying to find dignity and happiness and the next moment you think, oh, fuck, where are my keys? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I wanted you to distinguish literal and metaphorical search target. I sort of spilled the beans on that. But uh, nonetheless, you get the idea, you get the picture that uh, this is what you're doing. <clears throat> um, there are literal searches. You search for survivors, for drugs, for food, for keys, for plants. <laughs> no idea what that is about, but you can click on that. Yeah. And that will give you concordance of search for and then the collocate plants. Uh, takes a while again. Yeah. So if you click on it accidentally, that happened to me a couple of times. Uh, you have to wait for a minute or so before you get the results and can go back to this. Right. Um, now, the metaphorical ones, the ones that interest us. Yeah. Dignity, happiness, truth, meaning, identity, knowledge is down here. Yeah. So it fits the bill. Yeah. And um, you're searching for words. That is something else. Yeah. When you're searching for words, you are trying to find the words that best express your ideas. And that's a different kind of experience. Right. So searching for immaterial things to sort of come back to the initial question that I had. <clears throat> the typical elements that we have when we search for things that are not objects, uh, we find abstract ideas with generally positive meaning, such as dignity and happiness. Yeah? And then these elements are concerned with a fulfilled human existence and trying to attain these elements is conceptualized as a process of searching for something valuable. Okay, so finding meaning in life or finding your identity, that is something, it, it doesn't just come to you. Yeah? You can't sit on your ass and uh, expect that you will suddenly be enlightened, but rather you have to search for it. These things are cultural. Yeah, so this is kind of a cultural model that we have, and the English language expresses this cultural model that, look, you have to go and search and find, and then if you found it, then you will be happy, and you'll have your identity and dignity and whatnot. That's part of the fun with metaphors. They're always so, I don't know. Okay, now I want you to do an exercise. Um, We'll leave alone searching and happiness for a while and we'll concentrate on a different verb, namely lift. Okay? So the basic question is what immaterial, non physical things are there that you can lift? Normally you're lifting boxes or something heavy or, you know, your bags. Um, but searching through corpus data, we can also come across non physical things that can be lifted. <clears throat> so I would like you to conduct a concordance and a collocate search for forms of the verb lift. <clears throat> and I want you to identify metaphorical examples and literal examples of lifting. And I want you to see what important collocates of metaphorical lift we can identify with Antkong's uh, collocate tool. Okay. And um, as the last part of the exercise, I'd like you to describe some metaphorical mappings <clears throat> between uh, the source domain, yeah, lifting, and whatever target domain you discover, yeah, whatever abstract meanings are talked about with the verb lift. I would say allow maybe 15 minutes for this kind of exercise. Uh, see how far you get. If you get stuck, then by all means, you know, continue watching this video. Uh, but if your creative juices are sort of flowing, then uh, keep going. Yeah. And uh, after that, come back to this video. I'm going to continue in three, two, one. Now, so what I did, I went to the concordance tool of Antkong and I searched for lift and a star in order to find all the verb forms of uh, lift. So lift, lifted, lifts, uh, lifting, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, you see here 
I kept the sorting at uh, first, second, and third to the right. So if you have those uh, settings, the first example should be uh, lift a band out of newspaper print, lift a bed frame designed by Salvador Dali, and so on and so forth. Okay, now can we see um, literal examples here? Well, yeah. Uh, so she reached down, is it a she? Well, someone reached down to lift a black bag off the floor. Okay, someone picking up a physical thing. But here, wouldn't that lift a burden from your shoulders? This one is kind of interesting because, well, a burden is can be a physical thing, but wouldn't that lift a burden from your shoulders means that, well, uh, you have some kind of worry, and uh, then this worry is uh, taken away, even taken away is metaphorical, of course, so this worry no longer exists, uh, so a burden would have been lifted from your shoulders. Okay. Uh, lifting a cup to the mouth. Oh, someone can lift a finger. So, of course, that's metaphorical as well. So, you don't do anything. You don't lift a finger. It's probably more metonymic than metaphorical. <clears throat> uh, yeah, okay. So, let's look at the um, Coloca tool. Settings are the same as before. So, I just uh, left the uh, search expression and had the settings, uh, well, three words to the right, zero words to the left, minimum colocate frequency three, sort by the mutual information statistic. And uh, this is what we get, yeah. <laughs> Funny results, bedrooms, singles. So if you click on that, you'll find there's one file in our corpus files, which is about hotels, yeah. And those hotels, they have amenities such as lifts, hair dryers. Yeah? So this is where this comes from. Uh, and obviously they have single bathrooms and probably also double bathroom uh, bedrooms, sorry. Um, okay, that's where this comes from. So this we can sort of safely ignore. Um, yeah, Gasthof. <laughs> ah, Corpus Data. Now, um, look at this list. Yeah. What do we find that is metaphorical, that is about objects that are not physical, that can be lifted? I think you see them, yeah? So, embargo, <clears throat> martial, that's not martial arts, that's martial law. So, martial law can be lifted. <clears throat> Spirits can be lifted. So, when your mood is sort of not so good, and uh, then something nice happens, your spirits are lifted. 12 examples, so that's a, yeah, uh, that's an idiomatic expression. A veil can be lifted, so first you didn't see it, then you do see it. Morale can be lifted, so that's kind of like the spirits, yeah. Sanctions, sanctions can be lifted, that's kind of like the embargo. So again, you see that there is some systematicity there. Some words tap into the same underlying metaphor. Um, okay, so I identified two main metaphorical mappings here. So with the words embargo, sanctions, restrictions, and martial law, well, we only found, found martial, but if you click on it, you see that the examples are about martial law. Uh, those are political measures that restrict action. Yeah, that is the target domain. That is what these examples are about. And uh, the word lifting appears with those words, indicating that uh, lifting these political restraints uh, means that action is again possible. Okay, um, so that is one metaphor that we have with lifting. And then there's the second metaphor with spirits, morale, and hopes. So this, you know, your mood, your psychological disposition, um, moods can be up or down. Yeah, You can say, I'm feeling up today, or I'm feeling a bit down, or, oh man, that really got me down. Um, so this up-down 
axis is very much an active metaphor with uh, spirits, morale, and hopes. And if something lifts your spirit, then that means that you have a more positive outlook on life, your mood is better, you are ready to take on the big challenges, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is something that you can find out about metaphorical lifting on the basis of corpus data with a few clicks in a concordance tool. And that is kind of cool, don't you think? I think it's kind of cool. So here I uh, drew up a few mappings between uh, the domain of lifting and the domain of restrictions. So talking about the embargoes and the sanctions. So we can compare uh, an embargo or a sanction to a curtain that you know, constitutes a boundary between two areas of space. Um, and you can't go through that curtain. Yeah? So that, that is a border. And there's a person who's in control of the curtain. And that person would uh, map onto, in the target domain, the institution that is in control of trade restrictions or what kind of other restrictions you might think about. When the curtain is down, action is restricted. When the curtain is up, action is possible. Yeah, so this is how we think about embargoes and restrictions. They uh, can be lifted and then uh, life can continue. Right, let's move on to the second approach where we start with the target domain. <clears throat> so in uh, the two previous analyses with searching for and lifting, these are words from the source domain that we use to talk about more abstract things. But we can actually also take the more abstract words and check how they are being talked about. So what kinds of words occur in their neighborhood. And uh, one particularly fruitful domain for this kind of enterprise are emotion words. So here I've taken the example of fear. Yeah, you could also take something similar like shame or disappointment or joy. Yeah. Um, but let's uh, do this exercise with fear. Do me a favor and just uh, type in fear into the concordance tool. Um, with slightly different sorting settings. Yeah? So here I set the sorting to the first word to the left, and then uh, the, the second to the right, and the third to the right. That's not so important. The first to the left, that's kind of uh, important. <clears throat> so that the uh, first word to the left will appear in red. And I scroll down a little bit. Okay, so that, uh, well, the first one is probably uh, example 453, and it reads the gripping fear of losing your something. Yeah. Okay, and here you immediately see that there are some collocates that do not belong, strictly speaking, to the domain of emotions, but rather they come from some other domain. There is some other source domain uh, that comes into play. And I'm specifically uh, thinking about these instances of growing fear here. Yeah. So fear is something that can grow. Now, what are the things that can grow? You tell me. <clears throat> Plants organisms of some sort, yeah, biological things grow. So fear is conceptualized, or it's at least talked about, in terms of uh, some kind of biological entity that can become bigger. Which is weird, yeah, because fear is a chemical response in your brain. Um, it's not a living thing, yeah. But apparently, speakers of English, writers of English, like to talk about it as if it were a living thing. Not only with growing, yeah, but when you look at the uh, first example here, the gripping fear. So fear is often talked about in terms of, uh, yeah, let's say a person who holds 
the, the, the fearful experiencer and you know, keeps them in a tight grip so that they can't move. Yeah? We also talk about paralyzing fear, so not being able to move. That, that seems to be a recurrent theme in uh, the way we talk about fear. <clears throat> On this screen, I have the same data, but I sorted them in a different way. So I applied the sorting tool in such a way that uh, the first level is the first word to the left and the second level is the second element to the left. So we have all of these green elements now showing up to the left of the red elements. Um, I did that and then I scrolled down all the way to example 753. So if you want to do the same, uh, pause the video and do that now so that you see the exact same screen that I have here on this slide. Right, so what do we see? Uh, two examples that I want you to pay attention to are these here where it says full of fear. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, full, yeah, that is a source domain that uh, brings up the idea of a container that can be empty or filled to a certain extent or it can be full. And apparently fear is a kind of substance that can fill a container. So for example, the experiencer can uh, be full of fear. So the experience of being afraid, of uh, experiencing fear, can be talked about as if though I have a substance inside me that completely fills me up and that substance is fear. Yeah. All right. Um, other examples here, so we have the grip of fear that corresponds to things I said earlier, that fear can be a person who holds you against your will <clears throat> so that you can't move. And further down, we have a mixture of fear and embarrassment. Oh my God, I know that feeling. Um, yeah, so mixture, that goes back to this kind of substance conceptualization of fear. So fear and embarrassment are substances that can be mixed and you can experience them at the same time. Uh, just in the same way that you can mix different substances in a container. You so can mix um, <clears throat> uh, eggs and flour or you can mix oil and spices and things like that. Yeah. Okay, so fear not only an organism, not only a person that holds you, but also some kind of substance, some kind of fluid, perhaps. Emotions are often talked about as fluids. Um, and we see this in the left-hand collocates. Okay, so do me a favor and click on the collocate writer so that we can explore this in a bit more detail. <clears throat> Here, I changed the settings a little bit. Yeah, so... Fear is the term that we have in the search window. Uh, the um, <clears throat> Windows, man, sorry, this is wrong. So what's in here is the correct setting. So the window span is from the third word to the left to the search word itself. Yeah. Minimum frequency is still three. And I've sorted by the mutual information statistic. And what this gives us is this kind of list of collocates. And it should look the same for you if you have the settings set up in the same way as I have. Right, so what do we have? We have trembling, conquer, hatred, envy, ignorance, cape, anger, overcome, shaking, threats, founded, and so on and so forth. So um, let's make an assessment of this. So. Clearly, we have other emotion verbs, uh, emotion words like envy or anger, hatred. Yeah? So <clears throat> fear collocates with these emotions. So fear and hatred go together. Fear and anger go together. Uh, there are some physical responses like trembling, shaking. Yeah? Um, there are words such as, well, let's, let's look at this. So apparently fear is something that you can conquer. So what do you conquer? You, you, you conquer your enemies, right? So fear is conceptualized as a kind of enemy. 
Um, and you can overcome that enemy. So these two actually go together. So apparently fear is something that you have to fight. Okay. Right. Um, here's another interesting uh, collocate besides. So someone can be besides themselves with fear. Um, that's a kind of weird metaphor, right? So you're not really inside your body, you're standing next to yourself because you're so afraid. Meaning again that you're not fully in control of what you're doing. Um, right, so let's summarize what we've seen in the concordance lines and in the collocates. So fear can be an organism, uh, as in growing fear, it can be a substance, as in full of fear, mixture of fear and embarrassment. It can be a person that holds you against your will, so gripping fear or paralyzed by fear. And we might actually think about linking this uh, <clears throat> to the collocates of overcoming fear or conquering fear. Yeah. So this person that holds you against your will, that is sort of an enemy that you have to fight against. Okay, there's also, uh, okay, that's actually a collocate that I forgot here. There's the collocate in, if you scroll down a little bit further, yeah? And uh, that means that fear cannot only be a substance, it can also be a container. Yeah, so those metaphors, they don't have to be consistent. There can be different metaphors. So you can live in fear, meaning that fear is conceptualized as a kind of container. Okay, so that was one example of uh, starting with the target domain. And you maybe anticipated this. So I want you to do an exercise applying the same steps uh, with a different word. Namely, how do we think metaphorically about panic? So panic is kind of like fear. It is uh, an emotion that is negative, that has to do with anxiety. But it is also different. So fear is sort of um, slow and um, you know, creeping up on you. Panic goes like this. Yeah, it's, it's a punch in the face. And then you're panicking. Um, similarities maybe is that you are you feel paralyzed you cannot do anything so this gripping thing yeah um, but let's look at this from a corpus linguistic perspective so do me a favor conduct a concordance of panic do a collocate search for panic and uh, look at a number of metaphorical examples literal examples, identify important metaphorical collocates of panic, and then try to compare the metaphorical mappings for panic and fear and see if you can tease apart how they differ and how they overlap. Okay, if you want to do that now, hit pause. I will continue now. Okay, so I just went to the concordance tool and typed in panic. <clears throat> There are not that many examples of panic. Uh, 251 is what I found. And uh, okay, so what we have here, in a panic. Lots of examples of in a panic. So apparently this container metaphor is strong with panic. You are in a panic and then you can't get out. It's like a prison. <clears throat> get into a panic. That's interesting. So let's maybe follow that up with a collocate analysis. Okay, and uh, the top collocate that <clears throat> Ancong identifies, again, the, the settings are three words to the left, uh, zero words to the right. Sorry, this is wrong. Don't look at that. Uh, minimum collocate frequency three, sorted by mutual information. And the first item on our list is blind. Okay, so when you're in a panic, you can't really see anything. Yeah, your judgment is clouded. <clears throat> what else do we have? A moment of panic. So again, fear you have for a long time. Panic is more concentrated temporarily, but that is literal panic. Yeah, So it's not a metaphorical moment of panic. Uh, fear, of course, collocates with panic. Don't panic. Yeah, sure. Uh, into. So 
that is something that we see with panic. It's not something that we saw so much with fear. So you can, um, well, let me click onto into. Well, first of all, uh, here are the examples for blind panic. Um, but into, here we have the examples with into. His publishers fell into panic when we get into a panic to have gone into a paralyzing panic. Yeah, so this idea of not being able to move, not being able to act. He slips into panic, was thrown into panic, went into panic. <clears throat> so apparently, uh, panic is the kind of container that you can fall into. Yeah, kind of like a trap or some kind of hole in the ground and if you're not careful then you fall into it and then you cannot move you cannot get out of it that is uh, how we like to think and talk about panic and the corpus data reveal this interestingly enough yeah so um that's it for this video uh, i hope to have given you a taste for analyzing metaphors with corpus data. There's obviously a lot more that could be done, but the main thing that I want you to take away is that corpus linguistic analyses of metaphors, they can either start with the source domain or they can start with the target domain. And looking at the concordance lines and looking at the collocates can give you some important cues as to how metaphors are structured, as to how source domain and target's domain, target domains are, are, are linked, what kinds of mappings we see between them. Right, so homework for next time. Please read chapter 8 of uh, Lindquist. Do the quiz uh, for chapter 8 and uh, watch the next Ancong video tutorial. That's it for now. Peace out.